Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Uh, this is the second edition of our presentations on sourcing. We had a great response to the first one, which I was really excited about. I'm uh, really glad that you guys are interested in this subject. I think it's useful, not because cite citing a source is in itself that much fun or useful, but it tells you where you've been and it tells you who's responsible for the information. And when you're trying to construct the story of your family, those two pieces of information are critical. Today, what I'm going to talk about is how to cite web pages, and I'm going to give a specific example of uh, Find a Grave because there's a ton of useful information in there, and if you can include it, you will find that if you can include it properly in your tree, you will find it will really, really help your tree. So let's get started. All right. Why should you cite your sources? So you can find the source again if you need it. And so you can evaluate the quality of a source when you have conflicting evidence. If you're looking at a birth date and one is from a death record and the other is from a marriage record, the birth date may be more correct on a marriage record because that information probably came from the actual person or someone who knew the person at the time of the birth. The death record, you don't really know who it came from or it came from somebody who wasn't that close. It's not necessarily true which one is more correct, but by looking at the record that it came from, it will help you get the feeling of which one is right or at least you'll be able to make a better decision. Remember, and I think we all get too caught up in this. You all know the, you know, the phrase name gather, right? People who just attach, attach, attach. But family history is not about finding records to attach to your family tree. That's not why we find documents. That's not why we go looking for information. We're trying to determine kinship between people and understanding who they were, telling their story. We're all caught, we all have that bug, right? We all need to tell the story of our ancestors. That's what we're doing here. We're the ones who are the family historians. Having a tree with a bunch of records, that's a great start, but it's not the purpose. It's not really what you're after. That is not what the rest of your family is going to be interested in. So it's about what we do with those records. And this is a recap of what we did in the last presentation. The best reference for citing and sourcing, and there's no one who will disagree with this in the genealogy world, is evidence explained by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. You can purchase a downloadable copy at this particular link. You can also buy a copy, but it's about two and a half inches thick and it's really heavy. And if you get a downloadable copy, I believe it's cheaper and also you can search it and it's a lot easier to use. All right, but I'm going to show you some examples. All right, so last time we just talked about how you do things in Ancestry. And in future episodes of this presentation on sourcing, I'll do that as well. But right now I just want to talk about when you have an original source, and these are all going to be on the web. But regardless of where you get the information from, there's six basic items that you want for an original source. The author, if known or who is responsible for this. So it may be if it's a book, like if you were citing Elizabeth Schoen Mills Evidence Explained, she would be the author, Elizabeth Schoen Mills. Or who's responsible for it? If you're looking at a birth certificate that was recorded in the county of Rockbridge, Virginia, then it would be Rockbridge, Virginia. That would be who is responsible for it. Title of the article or web page, you know, what is the title of what you're looking at? Is it, um, how to write wonderful citations or is it you know certificates of birth something like that is it if it's a data collection on ancestry or you know family search or wherever what is the title of the actual data collection the title of the source where this came from you know where's the book what's the website so if you're taking something from find a grave the website is find a grave if it's ancestry it's ancestry.com that's a little bit different than the actual data collection or article itself, right? Because you might have Virginia births on Ancestry.com. So it would be Virginia births is title of the article, title of the source is Ancestry.com. And it takes a while to get used to, but once you start to see the patterns, it will make sense. Publication details in parentheses. I'll show you how to do that again in a minute. 
identifying information. If you're on find a grave, you'd probably put in the memorial number, right? Because that's really critical to finding it again. Um, if you're looking at a census on um, Ancestry.com or Family Search, we would want to put in the name exactly as is expelled in the index. I don't care how wrong it is, so somebody can find it again and maybe their birth year. And then this is really rare, but identification of a special item. And we'll get into that in some later episode. All right, so let's look at how this is done. I'm just going to use one of my web pages because I know how to get all the information quickly. So how do we cite a web page? Well, we're going to go down here and we're going to give the author. The title of the article goes in quotes. Make sure you put your comma inside. The title of the blog. And there's a lot of good stuff on blogs. People, I've seen them, you know, on the message boards and not. And they're like, eh, blogs, blah, blah, blah. They're horrible. Nobody knows anything. But you know what? If that's the best piece of information you've got, as long as you cite it appropriately and you know where the information came from, there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't matter where the information comes from. It just matters that you document it so you can evaluate its validity. All right, so title of blog, publication details, identifying information, and then optional info. You may want to say what it is you got out of here. So on this particular one, I'll put my name because I'm the author of the blog. And you know what? If you don't know who the author of the blog is, some people don't make that really obvious, and I don't know why. You can just leave it off. That's fine. This is the title of the article, Wisdom Wednesday, Wyatt and Laura. And by the way, this right here is called a blogging prompt, Wisdom Wednesday. I belong to Genia Bloggers. And if you blog about genealogy, I suggest that you go sign up on Genia blog Bloggers um, because that's a great way to publicize your blog and get people to actually look at it. All right. The name of my blog is Finding Forgotten Stories, so I put that in italics and I identify it as a blog. You could do that or not. That's up to you. Then, the publication information, how you would find this, and you could go a couple ways here. You can either put the URL of just the blog, and that's what I did because, because I have the title of the article, you could go find it. Or you could put the URL to the actual article. It's really your decision. Um, one is obviously longer than the other, but you know it, it's what you feel does the best job of explaining this. Then you put accessed, space, colon, space, and the date that you access this on. Now this article might go away. Maybe I give up on my blog, right? And I delete everything and it's gone. Okay, that's fine. But you know this documents that on that particular date it existed. All right, so that right there is the end of the citation. I wanted to put in here, it documents Wyatt and Laura's death dates and burial location. All right, so that's how you put that together. And if you just come up with this right here, author, title of article, title of blog, or whatever, publication details, identifying information, and you just fill that in every time, you've got a pretty good citation going. So what you can do then is if you're going to put this, and let me go live here for a second. Let's say that you were then going to put this in your family tree maker. And again, you can put this in any kind of, everything that I'm showing you here, you can put it online, you can put it in a paper, you can put it on one of the other desktop softwares. I use, I use Family Tree Maker. So what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to go to person. And I'm going to go to burial. All right. And then I'm going to put in a new source. So over here, you see where it says new. I hope that's readable. I'm going to click on new and I can either say add new source citation or use existing source citation. Well, I've not entered this one, so I'm going to use add new source citation. All right. I've never any entered anything from my blog before, so I'm going to go to new. And again, you can fill all of this stuff in, but I find it easier just to create templates for what I'm doing and then fill them in myself. That makes me happier. So again, you know, everybody comes up with their own system and that's totally fine. All right, so the title of this source, I'm just gonna, cause this is the first thing that appears in the source, so I'm gonna put my name. This is a very self-centered uh, presentation, isn't it? All right, 
One thing that you might want to do, and I didn't show this to you last time, and you might find this interesting. On the source, I could put down here in comments my template. So I could just take that, cut and paste, and put it here, and then it's always there. I know that's the template I want to use every time that I do this. All right? So next time I pull this source up, it would be there. All right, so I'm going to say OK. Now I've already written my source, so I don't have to do that again. And this will already appear. So I'm going to cut and paste that. Templates are the key to making this thing work. I'm going to put it in there. I'm going to click OK. And then I've got my source. And it's done, right? And I can duplicate it. I can say, oh, you know, this also has his death date on it. I should really put it down here. So I can say, new source. I'm going to use an existing source citation. Up here, I start typing who the author is. And you'll see it down here. And then I've added my source. And then I can just add it for everything that it documents. So it's nice and easy. Now one thing when I do web pages, because web pages always change and you never know what's going to happen, I use a program, and again, this is just me, it's not an official Ancestry.com um, endorsement, but I use a program called Snagit. And what I will do is I will go ahead and take that picture and I will use it, I will attach it in my source. So let me show you how to do that. So I've already cut and pasted this, I've got it in Snagit. And I probably would actually do a snag it of the actual information that I had. But for our purposes, let's just go ahead and use this. So I can then save it. I just put it in a temporary folder. And I'm going to use these folders, and I'm going to show you more about this in my next demo where I show you how to organize yourself online. At least it works for me. All right, so I'm going to save this. I'm going to call it just FFS for Finding Forgotten Stories because that's nice and simple. I go over here. I open the source, I click on media, I attach new media, and it's under my desktop, under temp, there it is, FFS, and this is, you know what, there's not anything for blog, so I'm going to add a new category name, and I'm going to call it a blog, and then I just save it. Now, if that page goes away and I've taken an image of the information, I've got it, right? I can look at it again and I don't have to worry about it. This will be really useful on Find a Grave. But if you just take little pictures of what it is you're looking at on the web, it'll really make your life a lot easier. All right, so let's go look at Find a Grave. All right, so this is the same person, my great-grandfather Wyatt Paul Gillespie. And this is, an, is the whole image. I entered a bunch of information. I've got his tombstone. Um, Find a grave already has a cemetery photo, so there's a couple photos on there. All right, so let's go back this way. Here's the basic format for a Find a Grave um, citation as recommended by Elizabeth mm -hmm. Schoen Mills. However, you should know there's no one right way to do this. And depending on what it is that you're trying to emphasize, you may do it in different ways. But find a grave is a fairly common way to get information, at least because it has tombstones, and to put it into your family tree, right? So having a nice standard way to do this is really useful. So you have the name of the site, right? This is the actual website. It's made up of database and images. Now, why would you want the database and images in there? Because these aren't really the original sources. These are um, pictures. I mean, you don't have the actual tombstone in your collection. So it tells you I can go there and I can look it up and I will find images there. The publication information, findagrave.com, accessed. And I put everything in my templates in capital letters that I know um, I have to go back and replace. Then you want to have comma, memorial page for a person. 
and then say find a gray memorial number and then what the number is that number is right down there and you can look up find a graves um, memorials by their number and that can be a really fast way to do it and then citing the cemetery name and the location you'll notice I don't have the author in there and usually because you're citing the tombstone itself and eh, that probably isn't the most important thing but I'm going to show you a variation of that where you can put it in okay so for this particular one I can say find a grave database and images access the 2nd of August 2012 a memorial page for Wyatt Paul Gillespie and you want to use the name that's up there because that's what you would search on it's find a grave memorial number 56048050 citing Stonewall Jackson Memorial Cemetery in Lexington Virginia and then you can put that into your database and I've already done that and I'll go back and show you that one in a minute but this is also a web page and let's think about what it is that you're trying to cite. If you're just using this because you want to cite the information that's on this tombstone, which is his birth and his death date, okay, that's fine, right? But you'll notice I've also written other information in here. And a lot of people, when they write uh, these pages, they will put information in that they know, whether they be family relations, <coughs> excuse me, or um, I put in here he lived at 108 Houston Street, Lexington, Virginia in a house he purchased in 1907. That's information that comes from me, right? That's not the actual tombstone. So that's a little bit different. And you may want, if that's the information you're going to use and that's the only source you have for that or a source for that, you might want to cite it a little bit differently. So I came up with a different one and I just used the basic web page um, format here. Author, whoever was created by. And think real carefully when you put your find a grave names. If you have loves teddy bears, that would, be, as the created by, you would have to put up there loves teddy bears. Looks pretty silly, but there you go. Wyatt Paul Gillespie is the name of the web page. Find a grave is, uh, you can put it either find a grave or find a grave.com. It's up to you. Uh, the URL, I accessed it. It's a memorial page for Wyatt Paul Gillespie. Find a great memorial number. That's the identifying information so somebody can go back and find it. Citing Stonewall Jackson Memorial Cemetery, Lexington, Virginia. And then I add a semicolon and the information that I pulled from here so somebody understands it. Stage address was 108 Houston Street. That's the information I pulled from here. Now, we can go now and Put this information into our software desktop the online tree piece of paper wherever you want to put it one thing i would suggest you do if you're going to put this on family tree maker is you go to the web page and you do exactly what i did here you could just take this photo and save it but you didn't take the photo and you know some people just don't care i mean if you were to take a photograph from any of my find a grave pages and put it on your site I personally would not care they're your ancestors just as much as they're mine it's a tombstone this is not a piece of art if you want to put it up there that's fine but some people would rather you not and you should respect that so what I do is I capture the whole thing right you can do it in snag it you can do it in paint you can do it in a whole lot of different ways um, but I captured the whole thing. So I've got the pictures, I've got where the burial is, I've got all the information, I've got who it was created by, where it was recorded, and the find a grave memorial number. And I've got that whole image there, and then I can attach it to my source, and I don't have to guess. I don't have to remember. It's just all there. So when I go back over here to my tree, do, 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 there we go. I have my little source here which makes me very happy and I've got a way to do that. Um, I go over here to media notes and you'll notice I can then open that up and there it is. That's exactly as it was. Alright, so that's really, really nice. Anytime you're on the web and you find something, whether it be a blog page where somebody's written about your ancestors or find a grave or somewhere over on family search. Um, this is what I do whenever I'm on family search. 
And yes, we all use different sites. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, let me see if I can bring up a new window here. Let's say you were to go over to familysearch.org. It's a little slow today, isn't it? Let's see, I'm gonna, let's see if I can find my grandfather's, or my great-grandfather's marriage information. All right, so I'm gonna go here. I've got his information, but there's no image there, right? Okay, I can enter things in. I can put the source citation in. It's all lovely, it's all wonderful, but while I'm here, why don't I just make a copy of this web page? Then I can attach it to my source, and that's exactly what I looked at. And I have that, and I don't have to go back and look at it again. And it gives you something visual to work on. You can also do that when you're in uh, on the website. There are lots of our data collections that don't have actual sources, or excuse me, actual images. They all have sources, they just don't have images. So let's say that um, I'm gonna search for, actually let me go to advanced search so I can find exactly what it is I'm looking for. Uh, Gilbert Gillespie, this is my grandfather, and I know he died in 2003. And that should bring up his Social Security Death Index. Awesome. I can now attach that to my tree, but I am not going to have any kind of image with that, right? Because the Social Security Death Index is not on there. So what can I do? Well, I can take an image of that. And again, I'm going to talk about this more in my next, uh, next time when we talk about organizing. And I can capture what's there. And I also capture all this source information, right? Because that may not be the way that I want to put it in my actual sourcing on my program, but I have all that stuff there. So something changes, I still have it. If you think about it, this particular data collection has changed. Because of privacy laws, we've decided to stop publishing social security numbers for people who died within the last 10 years. I actually attached this before that change was made. And because I copied that image back when I attached it, I had the social security number. Capture the image. When you save it, you're going to be a lot happier. Trust me. All right. Anyways, so let's go back to the presentation. I went off on a real digression there, didn't I? Um, so when you were citing a web page, and it doesn't matter where you find it, right? If you have any kind of information that's useful to telling the story of your family, um, let's say that you've got Civil War ancestors and you know they fought a certain battle and you want to, and you know, you go to the National Park Service and they have nice pages that talk about all that kind of stuff, you can put that as a source for your person, right? Anything that you look at that has information, you want to be able to source. So, what do you put in that source when it's a web page? author, title of the article, and everything should have some sort of title. And you can usually see the title of the article up in uh, your information bar. Title of the blog or title of the website, you know, National Park Service. Maybe it's, that's the um, site you're looking at. Publication details, which is going to be made up of the URL and the date you accessed it, which is really important. Identifying information, you know, how did you get there? Were there search terms? Is there a number that identifies this particular page? Those kind of things. And, you know, if it's just an article, it may not have any of that. You can leave that off. And then a semicolon, and then if there's any information that you want to bring out in your citation on why you thought this was important. And you can just, and then take a picture of it, and you're good to go. And once you get into the habit of doing this, you'll find that it's really easy. Oh, I see somebody wanting to know the downloadable source of evidence explained. There's your URL. Um, I also see there's a, I've been talking and not reading the chatter here. You guys are also talking about um, places to get Snagit. Yes, that's a TechSmith product. Um, 
Windows 7 allows you to do this. Um, Microsoft Word, OneNote, I think, has some abilities to do this. There are different ways to do it. Look for, um, probably if you search on Google for free web capture, you'll probably find some stuff for that. There's all sorts of ways to take images of what you're looking at. Don't just look at it, gather, and go. Make sure that you collect as much information as you can. All right. So today we looked at how you actually cite a web page and how um, you get that information into your family tree maker, which you can then sync back and forth between the online family tree. If you're at all serious about this, you need desktop software. Whether it's Family Tree Maker or one of our competitors, choose the one that makes you happiest. I personally like Family Tree Maker, but that's probably not a big surprise. Um, but record where you got the information from. When I first got started, I wasn't doing that. And I go back and I look for things now and I have no idea how to find them. And that information is gone. And it just makes me crazy that I didn't do this. Save yourself a lot of grief and put this information in there. Your sources don't, and your citations don't have to be perfect. They just have to get you back to where you were looking at. All right, I hope this one was helpful. I think if we do this again with the sourcing, uh, there are a couple other things that I'd like to talk about and show you guys as, um, like if you get, um, there are lots of other sites out there, familysearch.com, there's all the roots web, or familysearch.org. Uh, you know, there's the Roots websites, there's lots of free sites, there's other paid sites. How do you pull that information into your family tree? And, you know, how do you source that correctly? So I think um, those would be good things for us to talk about in our next sourcing presentation. We, I will also do another one um, on how you source books, on how you source actual documents, on how you source photos. There's all sorts of different things. You don't want to do any one too much at a time. I hope this one was helpful. I think this is so important in helping you be able to go back and find what it is. Don't get so excited that you don't write this stuff down. You will be sorry. I speak from bitter experience, let me tell you. Um, at somewhere near the end of the month, I will be doing a presentation on how to organize all that stuff you find online so you can find it again without going crazy. And uh, I will talk to you guys next time. Um, I'll stay on the chat here for a few minutes and try and answer a few questions. But thank you very much.